السلام علیکم ایوری ون بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین السلاۃ وسلام علیہ سعید المبیا والمرسلین آئی ایم صوفیا سعید ایز یو آل نو اینڈ چیئر وومن آف مدینہ انسٹیٹیوٹ ان لل راک آرکنسا اٹ از مائی ڈسٹنکٹ آنر ٹو برنگ دا فرسٹ سیشن آف دس ٹو پارٹ ورک شاپ آن اے ویری کروشل کانورسیشن ٹو یو ٹوڈے ٹوڈے از آر فرسٹ سیشن اینڈ آر نیکسٹ سیشن ول بی ہوسٹیڈ آن سیٹرڈے سیم ٹائم سیم میٹنگ لنک So before I introduce today's presenters, let me explain to you what is about to happen. We will have 25 minutes of teaching by each of our two presenters. As they are teaching to you on the right hand side of your screen, you should be able to see a live chat feature in Zoom. If you don't see on the right side of your computer screen, go to the bottom of the screen and you should be able to find the banner there. and you, i invite you all to post your comments and questions any time while they're speaking as you hear them present their materials i also want to remind you to please keep your phones or computers muted till we start the q and a session at approximately 4 pm right after the teaching session stops and both of our presenters are finished we will have that q and a session for 30 minutes and that time i will be including your questions comments and i would also like to invite you to ask questions and comments directly to them so coming to our speakers we have two extraordinary panelists today who will bring two distinct perspectives on race to you both equally important for us to understand starting off with imam daud walid Imam Daud is currently the executive director of Michigan chapter of Council on American Islamic Relations. Imam Daud is also co-author of a book called Centering Black Narrative: Black Muslim Nobles Among the Early Pious Muslims. As I just explained to you that this is a two-part workshop series, so in the next series we will be talking about American Muslims and at that time Imam Daud hopefully will be presenting some of the wisdom from that book to you. Imam has served as an imam in various mosques. He has given lectures at over 150 organizations and he is a strong voice for Muslims on various media outlets. Imam Daud Walid has also received numerous awards of recognition from city council and mayor of Michigan and also from number of religious and community organizations. So we welcome you to our classroom Imam Daud. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Wa well, alaikum assalam. Our second teacher is Dr. Sara Tariq that we all know and dearly love. Sara is the Associate Dean of Student Affairs and College of Medicine at University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. Sara is well known among UMS medical students as a compassionate teacher and mentor who is nationally recognized in medical education and an exceptional physician who teaches by example. You all know that Sara is passionate about understanding and teaching about bias, privilege and power not only in medical education but also in our own communities and we are all aware of her phenomenal work and she has received lots of recognitions and awards for her work in the field of social justice. Sara, welcome to our classroom on race. Assalamu alaikum and thank you. Okay, and now I welcome you all for taking time out to learn about this very important issue, which is, and I am not going to talk about what happened because it is echoing on the streets of our nation. It is burning in our hearts and minds every moment of the day. So no introduction is needed on the issue. All I'll tell you is that today we will examine race from a spiritual and also a secular perspective. So you have a deeply spiritual and religious understanding and also um, an intellectual understanding of what the issue is about. In the next week's session, we will talk about remedies and solutions to the challenges of racial justice that we face at individual and societal level. So today we're examining the concepts of race, the underlying causes of race, and next Saturday we'll talk about remedies and solution. So I'm going to start with Imam Daud Walid today, who is going to help us understand racism from a religious perspective. What does Quran and our beautiful deen Tell us about racism and what are the, some of the underlying causes at interpersonal, at societal, and at structural level. So welcome Imam Daud and um, it's all your stage now. A'udhu billahi minash shaytoor rajeem, bismillahir rahim, 
الحمد لله الذي خلق السماوات والارض وجعل الظلمات والنور ثم الذين كفروا بربهم يعدلون والصلاه والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى اله الطيبين وصحبه الراشدين وتابعين لهم خير وسنا الى يوم الدين وعنا ما ارحم برحمه يا راحمين First of all, let me say, brothers and sisters, um, uh, it's a uh, honor and a privilege to be here with you and be a part of this discussion, this tiny discussion at this very uh, critical time in history of the United States of America. And uh, thank you, uh, Sister uh, Sophia, for the invitation. And also, I look forward to hearing uh, the kind of Dr. Sara, uh, may Allah bless them both. Um, in regards to this. Let me say from the, from the uh, onset before going into this actual uh, uh, subject, I'm going to be showing you some slides. When we look at things uh, that manifest in society, material manifestations, physical manifestations, it is of our belief that we believe in metaphysical realities, not just physical manifestations. We are people of faith. We believe in the unseen, and we believe that simply what we see on the surface, that there are deeper spiritual realities. As the Prophet وسلم, he said to us, that for every outward reality, there is a deeper spiritual reality or there's a haqiqa. Are you all having problems hearing me? Excuse me, Imam Daud. Yes, I was going to just say that you, there is some kind of um, disturbance hmm. in your voice. Can you check your internet connection, please? Uh, I just checked with the students and a lot of them are having the same issue. Huh. No, I have a strong signal here, I'm, and I'm right next to my router. Am I breaking up now? No, it's much better now. Okay, it's better now. Okay, alhamdulillah. Maybe I'll, I'll, speak, I'll speak louder. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> as Muslims, as I was saying, that we just aren't a people of uh, material considerations, and that for every physical manifestation that we see about anything at er on earth, we also believe that there is a metaphysical reality behind that. So we just are not, <clears throat> we are just not a people of, of what uh, our, our Sheikh, uh, Dr. Muhammad bin Yahya Ninawi, Hafidhullah, he said, we are not simply a people of El Madiya. El Madiya means materialism or simply uh, material uh, considerations. So uh, with that, <clears throat> let me uh, share the screen with you relating to uh, this presentation in which we plan on going over uh, racism from a perspective uh, of Islamic spirituality. So this is what we will be covering uh, now uh, in these next few moments. Well, hold on one second. This is actually in the wrong order of my slides. I don't know how this happened, but let me move this here. Tayyib. Okay, so uh, my slides got mixed up here. Oh boy, this is not good. Okay, Bismillah. Sorry about that. So, in uh, Islamic textual literature, uh, the term racism, or how we use, or how Arabs use the term al unsuriya this term was not used by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It is not in the Quran. It is not in our early books of fiqh, nor is it in our early books of Islamic spirituality. So you will not see Imam al Ghazali, for instance, use this particular term. Uh, and race, as we look at it now, is a, is a, they didn't have the same construct of race in uh, Arabia 14 
centuries ago as we understand different racial, categor uh, racial categories. But what the Arabs did suffer from, and we have this term in our Hadith literature, we do have our early scholars who talked about this issue that is known as al asabiya al asabiya being blameworthy tribalism, about sticking to one's group and having uh, an excessive amount of pride in one's group or in an individual themselves looking down upon others or marginalizing others based upon this attachment that they have that relates to um, uh, lineage primarily is how this is understood, but through extrapolation uh, that El Asabiya is connected to El, to El Unsuria. So I want to tell you a, a, a story from the Hadith to kind of like point you to what racism necessarily is not because Allah Azawajal teaches us in the Quran about things uh, based upon contrast at times, right? He contrasts or compares one thing with another, right? He compares or shows you, for instance, the heavens and the earth, right? About light and darkness, right? We have dhulumat and then we have a nur, right? So perhaps I need to uh, try to paint a picture with you. So we have a hadith, um, and it's corroborated by a stronger hadith. Um, this hadith is narrated by uh, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal and also ibn Majah and others, where a man comes to the Prophet uh, وسلم, and he says, he asks the question, is it from blameworthy tribalism that a man loves his people? Now, this question was asked in Medina. Now we know that in the pre-Islamic era, Arabs took a lot of pride in their tribal affiliation to the point that it caused many societal problems and putting down other people and even wars based upon this ta'asab or this al-asabiya. This was like part and parcel of Arab culture prior to, the, uh, prior to the Quran being revealed. But this man asked a question, is it bad, is it tribalistic or is it racist that, I, that a man loves his people? And the prophet said, no, it's not racism. It's not blameworthy tribalism to love your people. So then he said, Mal uh, asabiya, Mal asabiya, O Messenger of God, then what is the blameworthy tribalism? What is the racism that we should be staying away from? And according to Sunan Abi Dawood, and I put the Arabic text here, it, he said, and to Ina Kalmaka Alazulum. It is helping your people or the helping one's people in wrongdoing. In this hadith, but literally he's responding back to the individual Sahabi, and to Ina. When you help your people in wrongdoing based upon that attachment, then that is blameworthy tribalism or racism. Now, this word dhulm is very important. Al-dhulm. al uh, This dhulm that the Prophet is talking about, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it relates to not just on an individual level, but on a broader level. And the word dhulm, according to a, a uh, definition of the sacred law. Zulm means taking something out of its proper place that God intended it to be in or to function in. Okay? So, what doing or oppression? From a Shari'i perspective, from the sacred law of Islam, is that when people take things outside of their proper places that God intended them to be in, or to people to deny certain rights that God gave people, not the state, right? Not personally, by the democratization of morality. Sheikh Daoud, um, sorry to interrupt yes. you, but you started um, uh, uh, breaking up again. Okay. Just a few seconds ago. The, okay. the voice was very clear till 30 seconds ago. Okay. So, um, 
this this uh, first definition of wrongdoing of people taking things outside of their proper places, this relates to people denying people their God given rights and their God given humanity that God Almighty honored and bestowed upon all human beings. And mentions the Quran of Benny Adam. Allah says that He honored all children, irrespective of tribal background, ethnic background, or skin color, right? So, God, so Allah, He did a deed of faith. Listen, men, men, that He is not from us who call words to be tribal or racism. We said, men, men, all are not to be. He is not from us that fights others against the leaders. We're also be. And he is not from us that dies upon a lost beast or reason. The statement of exaggeration is not the same. One can actually be a Muslim and racism. Means that one is not Muslim in the sense of the, of the spiritual reality of what it means to be actual Muslim. Okay. Um, now, from a perspective, we're talking about the metaphysics of racism. Racism relates to the first act of rebellion against Allah Azawajal in creation. The first act of rebellion against Allah, against Allah relates to the issue of tribalism or racism. So we have this story in the Quran that is very clear that Almighty God commanded the angels and, the, and those in their assembly, and Iblis was amongst them, he was a jinn, the leader of them, in their assembly. Allah told them that he was making a vicegerent in the earth. And then he said, he commanded all of them to bow. And all of them bowed down to Adam, except Iblis. And then Iblis told Allah the reason why he didn't bow down. And this is in Surah Al-Ahraf, the 12th ayah. minhu, min nar, wa min tin. Iblis said, I am better than him, meaning Adam. You created me from fire, and you created him from the clay. This is the first act of racism in the creation, where Iblis thought that he was made of fire free of smoke, that it was superior to the clay. So this is, an, this is, ignorant, this is a level of ignorance. There's a level of ignorance on two levels besides Iblis disobeying the command. The first level is Iblis took pride in something that had nothing to do with his own merit, right? Nothing to do with meritocracy nothing to do with his actions. He admitted in the statement that he didn't create himself. And he also admitted in the statement that Adam didn't create himself, right? He had no control over himself being made of smokeless fire, nor did he have control over Adam being made of clay. And this is the ignorant of racism when someone thinks they're better than another person just because of what uh, group they were born into or their skin color or hair texture because they had no control over that This is God is the one who created that The second level of ignorance is This is the problem with judging people on the outside instead of the inside You know, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Talked about this about about people being judged by the content of their character not by their skin color so What's interesting about this in Al Hakim al Tamadi, one of the great Sufi scholars, also scholar of Hadith, mentioned this. He said that also what Iblis failed to understand is that he made a fire free of smoke and Adam was made of clay on the outside, but that the human being is also made of water and water is a stronger substance than fire and water puts out fire because 
the, the, the majority of the human being substance of what we're created from is water. So he looked out the outside, but he couldn't see into the inside of what Adam was made of majority. And this is the problem when we try to judge people by exteriors like n shape of nose, skin color, hair texture, where they were born at, instead of looking at what's most important, and that is the character of people. And this is what, oh my God, sociological nature. When someone is operating off of racism, the spiritual reality of it is racism is satanic religion. Racism structurally in society is satanic. And the primary spiritual malady that informs racism is kibr and tekabr. It's arrogance, which then people who are arrogant then try to exert their arrogance over others, which is called a tekebr in the Arabic language. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and this is according to Sahih Muslim, he said that none can reside in the paradise if they possess arrogance, as Iblis could not reside in, in Jannah. And then the Prophet in the same hadith sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explain why. Because arrogance makes one reject the truth and people's rights, number one, the haq. And number two, it causes people to undermine humanity or undermine others. And we're talking about racism societally, not just on a one-on-one -on -one basis then this is the reality of the racism because people who have racism who are in the status quo is not just a one-on-one -on -one affair they actually uh develop hierarchies and develop systems to put other people down based upon they believing that people in their group are superior and thus should have power over those others who they feel to be inferior So, in Arab society, and I mentioned Al Asabiya, which was more tribal, people perceived themselves to be superior than others and had positional power upon others based upon lineage. But skin color and how we understand racism today in El, in El Jahiliya was not the same way as we, as we see things in American society or Western societies today. So, I'll, so being Arab at that time, as well as now, but back then in particular, being Arab really means two things in, in the tribal system. Number one, being Arab means that someone has paternal lineage to an Arab, meaning one, someone's father is an Arab, number one. Number two, an attachment to Arab culture, primarily the Arabic language. It doesn't relate to skin color or even who want, whose mother, uh, what her lineage is. So I will give you an example. Omar ibn al-Khattab was from Quraysh. Of course he was Arab. His great-grandmother, the mother of his grandfather, Nufail, she was Habashia, she was Ethiopian. 
then the mother of his father, El Khattab, his grandmother also was Habashia, Ethiopian. So Omar's uh, great grandmother and grandmother were both Ethiopian, yet he still uh, enjoyed full status as being an Arab and as being from Quraysh, even though Omar uh, is described as having not light skin and that Omar's great grandmother and grandmother were Ethiopian, but he still enjoyed the tribal privilege of being in Quraysh in the time of Jahiliya. And of course, this, this did not exempt him from later being a uh, uh, Khalifa uh, of the Muslims. The uh, tribal hierarchy uh, in uh, early Islamic history uh, start to re-exert um, itself with the misusage of what's called the Mawali system, meaning the client system, meaning that the word Mawali is plural for Mola. And this term meant in the old times that when someone had been enslaved and then they are freed from that uh, by the person, then they are called the Mola or the client of that person. And under the, um, the tribal society of the Arabs, if one was a client of someone, they would also consider to have the tribal protection of that who which they have clientship towards. Okay, this began to be abused in early Islamic history, starting with the Umayyads or Bani Umayya, and then it became even, uh, it still existed and became worse in some cases under the Abbasids, so called Bani Abbas, where there were, began to be certain privileges given to Arabs over non-Arabs, and to the point that even when people were free and had never been enslaved, that uh, in some cases, it was almost as if they became Muslim or non-Arabs that they had to attach themselves to a particular tribe. But in the process, there was a level of not being treated as Arabs. And uh, there's a lot of um, a lot of writings about this. I can't get to the full history of that. So I am making a for a reason that Islam as a spiritual system in the Quran, the teaching of the the righteous of the Catholics. We look at their statements and we look at how they govern, then we see that this material perspective, which exists culturally, we can say anti racism or anti racism. However, does that mean that? Uh, racist things didn't come back up into Islamic, uh, into Muslim texts, or that Muslims are racism free? Of course not. Doesn't mean that. And racism, I mentioned this because racism in the Muslim world predates colonialism. Because see, many Muslims we think we want to learn everything on the British colonies, but the British colonies is if we have the problem in Muslim society. Uh, of, of tribalism and racism because their skin color or, or their um, identity. That's, that's just all racism. And we read history of the, um, of the Omega, the Abbasid, you see this is absolutely not true. Let me uh, continue. I'll just conclude with this. Racism is not restricted simply to the prejudice plus power definition that uh, that in uh, Western sociological discourse and critical race theory in particular says. Now, of course, if one has is in a group in the status quo or has a power and that their bigotry racism can affect or marginalize someone more in a society of the group than, of course, this 
position to say that just because someone is a minority group and they hold racist attitudes or uh, say something racist to someone in the dominant culture that that's not consequence. There are consequences for that. The first consequence is a thumb. It's a sin on the, ind on the individual human being because the issue is that, that uh, as we understand um, in three parts, there's harm a law, it's called a shirk. In a shirk, right? This is what Lukman Salam told his son. And surely the worst form of wrongdoing, or the first, the worst form of wrongdoing is making partners with Allah. Then there's the dhulm that people do to other people that do uh, not end them their right. And then the other, the third form of zoom is the zoom that we do to our own souls. When we wrong our own souls by disobeying the commands of Allah and His Prophet. All of this is zoom. So we just can't say it's insignificant. We do harm ourselves and we also, uh, we, when we say things that are Islamic about people in the dominant culture, that there is an effect on the spiritual environment of the society, even if they don't harm people in the dominant culture. But the prevailing form of racism structurally in America is the false ideology of white supremacy. The difference between being anti-white supremacy and being anti-white and saying things uh, or calling white people bad names or saying things to white people, even if you don't affect them in the broader superculture, it has spiritual and negative spiritual import in, 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 from a metaphysical level. And it's not healing for society because we as Muslims, we're supposed to be uh, bringers of peace, people of redemption, and offering people spiritual remedies, which I will get to. Uh, next week, uh, inshallah, about some of these uh, uh, remedies from Islam as it terms to racism. Now, the issue, I mentioned that Iblis is the original racist. Now, we'll close with this. Iblis never had power over Adam. Never. And even over us, Allah Azawajal mentions this in the Quran. And just in conclusion, I will just read the, the English translation. But you have the, the Arabic in front of you. When people will go and try to blame shaitan, they'll go, they'll, 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 they'll go to Allah and basically say, the devil made me do it. Shaitan will reply, I had no authority over you except that I invited you and you accept it. So Iblis never had positional power over Adam. Iblis was never the son of Adam. So, uh, that's just from a perspective. If it, that racism is only prejudice plus power, that would negate the actual story of Iblis being the original racist. So, uh, I, I, I caution us about that language. But that I conclude, and um, inshallah, uh, I'm sorry for the breakup on this, and, and uh, please pardon me, and I will. Uh, turn it over to Dr. Sara for, for her, um, her presentation. Zakam Allah Khairan, Imam Daoud, and um, thank you very much for beautifully laying out so many different concepts, especially things that I didn't know. I mean, most of us didn't know about Asabiya, Zulm, um, Kibir, and uh, Mawali system. Unfortunately, there were several times when you were breaking so bad that we couldn't understand those concepts, and I might be teaching. Um, out to you again after this class because before we go to the next session next week we would like those to be clear um, to our students here so maybe you can summarize them at the beginning of the next workshop but I'll be reaching out to you to let you know what aspects of your workshop um, were not clear because of the voice breaking up so I have a few questions too but before we ask any questions let's go to uh, Sarah uh, Dr. Tariq will teach us about racism and especially involving 
prejudice and power, unconscious and implicit biases, as they connect with personal and structural racism. So Sarah, you have the stage. Go ahead, please. Absolutely. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Again, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, I am honored to be on the same platform with Sheikh Daoud Walid and grateful for his perspective. Um, although, as Sophia said, we, I missed a couple of points, which I, I hope to um, recollect. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the framework of racism. You know, as you, in case any of us missed this, we are in the middle of a social revolution of our lives and one that we've really never seen. We all know that we're in about the 12th day of protests, right? And I think it's because, and we've, I've never seen something like this happen, you know, um, in our country. And I'm, all of us, it has led all of us, I think, to reflect and think about what's going on. And I think we're in this space because we saw, all of us saw a man murdered, right? We saw a man take his last breath. And it shook us to our core. It shook our humanity. And for many people in this country, it uh, made us stop, really stop and think and empathize in ways that I don't think we as a country have empathized. So the goal, goal is really for us to have an honest conversation about race. But in order to do that, I think we need a framework um, for all of us to be um, sort of on a similar page because there's, there's a lot of words, there's a lot of terms that can be very inflammatory. And that is not our intention, as Sheikh said. Our intention is really to heal, and our intention is to bring people together. We don't want to marginalize anyone. Um, and we, in faith, believe in redemption. Um, and I'm, we'll, we'll talk more about redemption next week. But so I'm going to attempt to share some of my some of the framework that I have understood um, with some definitions, some imagery, and some story. And so there generally tends to be, when we discuss the framework for racism, there tends to be sort of two general frameworks that are out there, right? One is this individualist definition, which I'm going to talk about and which Schiff also referred to. And then this collectivist interpretation of what society has um, enabled um, as a result of multiple factors. And so we're, and I think realizing both of those frameworks, knowing that they're not the only framework for racism, but I think I'm going to touch on these two frameworks because I think they're important for our meaningful understanding of racism, right? We all saw this in 2014. Eric Garner's brought down. He's choked to death on the streets of New York. He stammers out 11 times, I can't breathe. No one bothers to administer CPR because they assess that he was breathing. An hour later, he's pronounced death, dead. The medical examiner rules Mr. Garner's death a homicide by the police. On December 3rd, so about what, six months later, uh, the Richmond County Grand Jury decides not to indict the policeman who did this, right? And this is, for me, I remember this image from six years ago, and it really helped. Um, it, that's the image that shook me. Yeah, it took a long time for, for me to be shaken, um, but it, it, that's the image that shook me. And I realized how racism in this country is an ins can be an insidious, cumulative, chronic stressor in the life of so many African Americans. Now, whenever we talk about the word race, I, I worry that these are the only images that we think of, right? Um, we think of the KKK, we think of the hate that people, some people emote towards people of color. Um, but racism, as, and the more I read about this, the more I realized how complex this con uh, concept is. And, and also I realized in, in reality, ordinary people like us, good-hearted people like us, also have a role in perpetuating racism. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, right? So we know, here's what we know. The United Nations convened in 2615 a worldwide workshop where they looked, um, focused on five different regions. And what they concluded was that racism now, today, is a worldwide phenomenon that requires a worldwide response. All societies and all of us in those societies have to address racism in the forms that it manifests itself uniquely in our lives and uniquely in our culture. And every one of us, whether we realize it or not, are living our lives in societies shaped by a history, right? Um, and in all societies, um, structures of inequality, including economic, have been laid down in the past and we live that right now, we live that today, right? So these two sort of frameworks for thinking about racism. One, it's an individual. Um, I do something to you because I think I'm superior to you because of a difference, right? I think I'm superior to you. And then there's this collective, right? And the individual is what we think about a lot. We think, oh my gosh, uh, that's horrible, right? All of us can agree that that's not good, 
right? It's bad for our spirits. It's bad for our soul. It's bad for our deeds. And it's bad for our humanity. And then there's this collective approach where we understand this as a political or social system, right? Founded on racism, right? And I'm going to talk about that a little bit. So that's sort of the big 50,000 foot view as, as to how I have learned about uh, these two frameworks. And then there's multiple types, right? Um, as I was doing my research, I was really struck by its complexity, right? And one person who I really, her, the way that she explained it to me, Dr. Kamara Phyllis Jones, she's an MD PhD, she's president of, president of the American Public Health Association and senior fellow at Morehouse. And her framework made, real, made really good sense to me. And she sort of talks about it in three categories. One is this big institutional racism. And that's the one that's hard to see. So I'm gonna spend some time on that. The second is internalized racism. Not gonna to spend too much time on that. And then the second one, the third one, excuse me, is personally mediated racism. And that's the one that I think most of us think about, right? We also have to realize that race is not a biological construct that reflects innate differences in our DNA. But racism is really, race is a social construct. As uh, Sheikh Saab talked about uh, in his talk, Hazrat Omar, Razi Allah Anu, had, was made of, had, was sort of multiple races, right? And so we don't know, we can't look at a, a black person and say, oh, well, their, their, their DNA is inherently different from ours. Science has proven that this is not the case, right? Um, so let's talk briefly. I'm, I'm going to hold off on institutional racism for a second. I'm going to go to internalized racism. What, is the, what does that term mean, internalized racism? In a society where blonde hair and fairness are widely regarded as ideal, it's not hard to see why people of color suffer from internalized racism. That is when we, as people of color, or black people, anyone as persons of color, accept those stereotypes that are placed on their own group as basically saying, what's that supposed to be? It's sort of this sense of less that being less than it's a sense of victimhood it's feeling like you know what this is how we've been like this we've been suffering for hundreds of years this is just how it is and it's it's being so overwhelmed with that lack of power that you kind of begin to kind of partly believe it you know when you're looking when you're thinking about um um popular culture a lot of people accuse michael jackson of internalized racism right because over multiple multiple surgeries of making himself look different and fairer people a lot of people criticized him about that. I think that's sort of a superficial way of looking at internalized racism. I think it's more of a psychological uh, sense of, yeah, we're just, it's just how it's supposed to be. I'm not, we're, we're we, part of you tends to believe that you are just a little bit less, right? You've internalized that racism that you've dealt with and your ancestors have dealt with for years. Okay, so I'm not going to spend too much time on internalized racism. There's personally mediated racism, right? And these are the words that we use a lot and throw around a lot when we talk about racism. Prejudice, right? What is prejudice? Prejudice is a belief held about a group of people based on very limited knowledge, right? Um, and of which bias, which I'm going to talk about in a second, is a form of that prejudice, right? Um, and then discrimination is action based on that prejudice. Discrimination, poor, poor service, right? Poor, no, um, poor, poor, you know, poor quality for a specific group of people poor quality care, right? No service, I'm not gonna give you, I'm not gonna serve you at this restaurant uh, because of your color. Police brutality, right? That's what we're talking about these days. Hate crimes, it's discriminatory actions based on your belief, which is the prejudice. So you can be a very prejudiced person and no one would ever know it, right? Because you don't act on that, right? So those are sort of the two terms I want us to pay attention to, is prejudice and discrimination. Now, let's talk a little bit more about prejudice. Prejudice, there's, I sort of see this uh, as in four different categories. One is explicit bias. That's the KKK, right? That is um, the, the belief and the actions that we know that a certain people are less than, us, less than we are, right? The good news is most of us lose this type of bias as we grow older and we meet people. Even if we have that fear as, let's say we have that, some fear as infants or as toddlers or as kindergarten kids, we ex are exposed enough to those people that our explicit biases go away. Okay. Studies show that simply knowing about a stereotype, if, if we know that a stereotype exists, we know from studies that it distorts the way our brain processes information about people. Okay. So let me give you some examples of stereotypes that I think many of us can have heard, maybe have heard throughout our lives. Black people are weaker students. Females are less qualified to be leaders. Why are black people so lazy? 
if a, if a black person came into this neighborhood, the property value would go down, right? Muslims are violent, right? All of these are stereotypes. And even if we do not believe it um, on an intellectual conscious basis, just knowing about those stereotypes can distort the, the neuronal connections that our brain makes and distorts our judgment. Okay, so explicit bias. Um, and, I'm, and then there's, a co oh, excuse me, colorism, um, implicit bias, and microaggression. So I'm gonna move on to implicit bias for a second because I, I learned this, this to me was a, a lot of a sort of awakening. Implicit bias is a mental construct, just like explicit biases. And as I said, stereotypes affect the way we understand the world. Stereotypes affect our actions and our decisions, right? Um, and these biases are activated sometimes without our even knowing it, right? So when we have stereotypes, like I talked about, we bypass deliberate thinking, right? We bypass the judgment process and our judgment is influences, influenced in ways that we don't intend, right? So I don't, I would say that all of us have implicit biases, right? And so in some ways we contribute to, if you could imagine racism as this sort of a pervasive feeling um, in the country, I'm not I'm just talking about America, I really don't know about other countries because this is where I'm from, um, we contribute to racism, right? Um, whether we like it or whether we realize it or not. So, but, so I don't want you to think that because all of us have implicit biases that we're evil. I don't see implicit bias as a weakness of character. I do see it as a habit of the mind, which can be changed, right? So we know, and implicit biases typically favor our own in-group. It figures, it, it, we sort of favor our own people, and that's okay, right? That's not evil, as she, the shift uh, referred to. But implicit bias is changeable. So let me talk a little bit more about implicit bias. So many of you probably have heard of this Harvard Implicit Association Test, right? Um, the Implicit Association Test is one of those rare research tools that has transcended to catch the attention of popular culture and the lay public, right? At its core, this test, I've got the link here, you can take a moment and take it uh, later on, um, takes about a couple minutes. It assesses how closely our brains link concepts, which can be as benign as flowers and pretty, right? Those are two concepts, pretty and flower, two concepts that we often commonly connect. Can flowers not be pretty? Well, yeah, they can be, but we associate those two things. Insects and gross, right? And there's a lot of people who love insects. Insects can be beautiful, but generally that, those are those concepts. And so, or more dangerously, blacks and bad, women and passive, right? And so, and the test asks you to pick these paired words instantaneously. Now this test has received some criticism um, in its methodology, but in its 25 years of inception, um, the implicit association test has been used in about 300 published studies and 800 articles, and a lot of people have used it. So I took, and you can take this test on about black people, women, obese people, um, LGBT people, you know, all kinds of, there's many categories in which you can take this test. So I took this three years ago on African Americans. Now, I have, re, racism is one of my areas of research in academics. I've been researching for six years. I work at Harmony Health Clinic, um, which is primarily a clinic that caters to black and brown people who have little access to care, right? This was my score. I had a slight automatic preference for European Americans compared to African Americans. What? I'm brown myself. How did this happen? So I didn't believe it. So I waited two months and I took it again. The score was the same, right? So what does, so it took me a while to process this. And what I understood and as I researched implicit bias was this. Implicit bias is the result of images. So when I'm watching TV, there are images that get transported through my eyes to my posterior cortex, to the back of my brain. And those, that, the back of my brain is like a PowerPoint of slides that constantly um, is showing me images that I don't consciously always realize, right? So just like so many people have associated Muslims with violence or Muslims with terrorism, wrongly so, I also have incorporated some of those images 
such that on an unconscious level, I also possess implicit biases against black people. And that's a hard pill to swallow on some levels, right? But it doesn't make me evil. It just, it is a habit of the mind that I have been working on to rid myself of, right? To be a genuine person, to be the best Muslim and human being that I can be. And that takes work. But I can't do the work if I don't know that I have it, right? I can't do that work. So that's implicit bias. So when I have said, uh, all of us contribute to racism, all of us on some level are racist, I refer to our biases that we all have. Then there's colorism. Now my South Asian brothers and sisters can totally relate to this, right? As as um, a lot of our African-American uh, brothers and sisters. Colorism is often viewed as a problem unique to people of color, right? Lighter skin is viewed as superior to darker skin. And lighter skin people have traditionally enjoyed social advantages over darker skin people. Darker people are dirtier, right? That's the view that we've heard. I have heard this growing up, even from my family members in India. It is alive and well today. But remember, colorism doesn't in, exist in a vacuum. We didn't make this up from our own selves, right? It is often a direct offshoot of um, an ideology, an ideology of colonialism, um, an ideology of white supremacy um, that values fairer skin over darker skin. And we all see this today. These are, Fair and Lovely is a common commercial in India um, that is still on TV today, right? So that's, so let's realize, what colorism is, and let's call it out as a form of racism. Number one. So that's not another point. Moving on to microaggressions. This happens a lot, right? Microaggressions are brief and commonplace daily verbal, environmental, personal indignities, whether intentional or intentional, that communicate an insult towards a particular group. So let me show you, here's some examples, right? Everyone heard about this case, right? This is Dr. Tamika Cross. She's an OBGYN from Houston, who was on a flight, a Delta flight, a patient on the flight becomes, a person on the flight gets ill, and the flight attendant asks everyone in the plane for help. Is there a doctor on this plane? Dr. Cross appropriately raises her hand to help, and the flight attendant says, oh, sweetie, we're looking for real doctors, right? That is an example of a microaggression, although some would call that a macroaggression, but that is an, uh, one example, right? This is another one. Uh, we've, a lot, I've seen both, I've seen this one. No, 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 where are you really from, right? Where are you from? My response, I'm from Alabama. No, 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 no. like where are you really from? No, I, I'm from America, I'm, 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 from, I'm, I'm from Opelika, Alabama. No, 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 but really, right? What they're trying to get at is you don't look American because you're brown. And there is one image of what an American looks like or two images of what an American looks like, right? Or here's another example. Courtney, I never see you as a black girl. So these little indignities are not inconsequential. They slowly break away at our confidence. They make us feel like we are less than, that we, uh, they make us, um, they contribute to our hesitation before we apply for prestigious positions. They make us less confident in speaking out. They make us feel like we don't belong, right? Because they tell us that there is one form of America, right? There's one way of looking. There's one way that we like looking at black people. Now let's talk about institutionalized racism. That, and I, I'm gonna hopefully be done shortly. Um, institutionalized racism is those unspoken societal norms that are accepted and practiced within an institution, whether it be my hospital, whether it be the government, whether it be local facilities that promote inequities, the police force, right? And um, it is often legalized and manifests itself as inherent advantage to a certain population of people. It is built within our rules, unspoken rules. It is written, um, it is built within our written laws. Um, and it is without an identifiable perpetrator. There's not one perpetrator for this. And that's what makes it very hard to address and fix, right? Um, institutionalized racism is often evidenced as inaction in the face of need. So when Eric Garner on the streets of New York was suffocated, and the jury found him, found the police officer not guilty, and he did get the police officer got fired, but that's it. That was inaction in the face of need, right? It is because I think of institutionalized racism that there is an association between socioeconomic status and race in this country. So for us to really understand what it is, I'm gonna share a few, few stories, right? 
Um, between 1525 and 1866, 12 million black men, women, and children were kidnapped and in, kidnapped from Africa and enslaved. About 4 million of those 10 million were brought, 12 million were brought to America. And most scholars think that up to 20% of them were Muslim. For slavery to succeed in America, people had to believe that the black slave was less than human because slaves had to be sold and traded like property. So we had to believe that they were less than human. They had to believe that slavery was part of God's grand plan, right? That the black person really wasn't a full human. He was human, but not a full. He was actually a savage who needed to be tamed, right? Slaves were stripped of their dignity, their families, and their faith. And Islam got lost in, in the generations. Um, and this whole ideology worked for 300 years until 1865 when slavery was abolished, right? Well, the South needed free labor though. We needed to have free labor. And black people who were slaves just the day before in the South found themselves without homes. They were just trying to figure out what to do with themselves and were often arrested for petty things like loitering, right? And because of that, were jailed for life and they were used as free labor. By 1916, 90% of black Americans were still financially captive and oppressed by the system of sharecropping. But then that evolved too, right? And then black people after that were systematically terrorized by lynchings for small infractions, walking the wrong way, looking at somebody the wrong way. Emmett Till, a 14 year old boy who was accused of offending a white woman in her family's grocery store was murdered in Mississippi, 1955. So basically, if you looked the wrong way, you were at risk for lynching and this was a form of terrorism. Move on to Jim Crow. And I have to, I'm not, I'm, people have written books about this, but I'm giving you a very brief glimpse. Jim Crow was the name of the racial caste system which operated primarily in the South between 1877 and the mid 1960s. When my father came to Mississippi, he faced Jim Crow in 1967. This was a set of rigid anti-black laws that prevented black people from spaces, from seats, from votes, and it became a way of life. Jim Crow did not die all of a sudden, people. I remember living in Mississippi in 1976. I was only five years old, but I remember the ghosts of Jim Crow were still there. I saw it with my own eyes. In 1988 in Cabot, Arkansas, black, 1988, people were not, black people were not allowed in community swimming pools. 1988, folks, this is not remote history. This is part of our modern history. So we drive by poor black neighborhoods and think, why can't they work harder? Why are they so poor? I've heard people talk about them with disdain of how they use up government money. You know, those welfare queens. I've heard people attribute what they see to laziness. So let's do some truth finding. Last two, two or three stories here to help us understand this picture and how it's connected to systemic racism. I love FDR. Better, Roosevelt was one of the best presidents in my mind for social reforms, right? What is the greatest source of wealth in America? How does the average American accumulate wealth? Home equity. You buy a home, it builds, builds value, and you get money. That is the greatest form of wealth in this country for the average American. Prior to 19, 1934, Americans had to give huge down payments or either inherit, their, inherit a home in order to live in a home or buy, to buy one. So the average middle class couldn't afford it. After 1934, FDR established, and part of his New Deal was the Federal Housing Authority, which sought to make home ownership more accessible, right? In the two decades after its implementation, the FHA fin financed 60% of American homes, which is amazing. Americans were now able to accumulate wealth, but only 2% of these loans went to people of color. Why only 2%? The practicing of redlining was pretty common, where banks red lines around black neighborhoods and Asian neighborhoods and Latino neighborhoods, make, marking them as high risk for loan default. So when they were going, you go to, you're a black person, you go to the bank, you try to get a loan. You want to, you live here, you want to get this house here. This is the area that's redlined because black people couldn't live in white neighborhoods in those times, right? Well, your area is now identified as a high loan default. Loan officer's not going to give you a loan. You're, this is an area of high loan default purely a racist concept that got institutionalized in banks. So that means you didn't get a loan, you had to live in a certain geographical location, and you had to rent. Well, if you had to rent all your life, could you ever accumulate wealth? No, you couldn't, right? This is what Philadelphia maps looks like. That's called redlining, right? So if those areas, if you can't, if those are the areas where black people are confined to, they have to rent, 
do you think Kroger or Walmart or, or Dillard's or any store is going to, to go there? No, because if, it's, if, if renting or buying, pro if buying property in a redlined area, uh, it means that you're high risk for loan default, they're going to charge you higher interest rates. Kroger doesn't want to go there and pay higher interest rates. Walmart's not going to go there. Small business owners aren't going to go there. They're going to have to pay higher interest rates, right? So the neighborhoods that we see in this city, in our Little Rock City today, are a direct result of discriminatory practices of banks um, at that time. Second story, FDR, signing the Social Security Act of 1935. FDR was a man of justice and compassion. The social programs that he laid um, that he built laid the foundation for much of success of modern America. His wife, Eleanor, a champion of women, a champion of African-Americans, a champion of migrant workers. But this bill is an example of how we inadvertently, with all good intentions, institute race, racist and exclusive policies when we don't bring everyone to the table. So what was the purpose of Social Security Act? It established a system of old age benefits for people, right? Um, people who had retired, or people who worked really hard and they retired and they got a check, right? But the problem was it left out African-Americans and immigrants. Where did African-Americans and immigrants mostly work before the 1930s? In homes and on land, right? Farming and homes. And the Social Security Act, for better or worse, but I think it was for worse, excluded those people, excluded agricultural and domestic workers. That excluded an entire population, a huge population. So if you're now 65, you worked all your life in a home as a domestic worker or on a farm, you could not accumulate wealth. You had to either work until you died or you got old, you had to live with your children, right? The elderly became a financial burden. The elderly minorities became a financial burden on their adult children who couldn't spend extra money saving up for their generation. They had to spend their extra money on their parents, right? While people who worked in buildings, who were allowed to work in buildings, white people, were able to collect social security in their old age, they didn't have to be a burden financially on their children, and in turn, they cannot accumulate wealth, which is why my grocery store looks like this, and the grocery store on Roosevelt looks like this, right? So this is not, Roosevelt Superstore did not arise in a vacuum. It arose as a result of these policies of redlining, right? Of property taxes, of, uh, um, uh, in, of specifically um, excluding African-American people in this country from accumulating wealth. That's what this is. But when we look at it on the surface, we think, gosh, why can't they like get their act together, right? Last story, Altgeld Gardens, Chicago. After World War II, president says, you know what, all these World War veterans, I'm going to make sure that they have a place to live, particularly the African-American ones. I'm going to create a neighborhood for them and for affordable housing. Great. Black World War II veterans come in, they, they collect, they live here. Over the years, uh, all of a sudden, people are getting ill. All of a sudden, pollution is so high here. What do we realize? that Altgeld Gardens is the area in the country that has the highest proportion of landfills, chemical waste landfills. Who makes those decisions? Who decides where a landfill goes? It's the city government, city officials, people who get voted by us to sit, on, sit around tables and make decisions about where landfills goes. These are pur this was purposeful. In America, the number one predictor of the location of a landfill, not poverty, it's race. Right, so these are not accidents. So how is this connected? I think we all figured it out now, right? It's not just one evil man doing something evil to another human being. It is part of that, for sure. It is part of a man making a huge mistake, but it also en engrosses an entire system here, right? An entire institution of an entire feeling of being made to feel less than, right? So yes, this is part of racism, absolutely. There is no doubt that it is, but, um, I hope that you sort of get a sense that this is a much bigger picture. And I couldn't de devote all the time I wanted to, we're limited on time here, and, but there's a lot we can learn um, from some of the institutionalized practices in this country. And so we're gonna talk about this later, but remember, what is the consequence of saying nothing and doing nothing? We know in our faith, it is our obligation, right? To either change something that you see wrong with your hand, right? Change it either in your, with, with your tongue, or at least change it in your mind, change it in your heart, right? So silence in the face of injustice not only kills any space 
space for productive conversations, but also allows cancerous right beliefs to grow. Um, and this was written by a, a black medical student who has faced small microaggressions throughout her life. Um, so Jazakallah for your time. Thank you all so much. Um, and uh, I'm happy to again join um, uh, Sheikh Dawood Walid in any discussion or any questions you all may have. Jazakumullah Khairun, uh, Sarah, for eloquently laying out um, this whole grand structure of racism. But I, what I really love from both of your presentations is that how you both started with, uh, with the individual and internal, whether it was implicit bias from you, Sarah, or whether it was uh, the spiritual melody of Kibir um, from you, uh, Imam Daoud. You both started from the individual and then you showed us how this led to this huge structures of racism, which manifested in our society. So at this time, I would like to, I see a lot of students from our school and our teachers um, watching us, listening to us. So I wanna open the forum to all of you. Uh, if you have, you have been hearing, so reflect on what you're hearing. Do you have any question directly coming out of the material that you heard our teachers present to you? or if you have any other questions related to racism too. Remember to unmute yourself before you speak. I, I excuse me, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum I, I have a comment um, to kind of put an exclamation point on what Dr. Sarah just um, presented. And I think this relates to uh, our perspectives and like trying to shift our frameworks in something that is closer to reality, because I think that many Muslims have fallen into this false framework of American exceptionalism. And the reality of it is, is that when we see like the things that have gone on uh, across America since before I was born, like my, my father was seeing these things and my grandfather, uh, who's 95, uh, turns 95 this year, inshallah, who grew up in, uh, in South Carolina as a legal slave in America, as a, as a sharecropper. Um, when people look at police officers who normally never get convicted for killing unarmed black people, and they say the system is broken, um, I say that the system is operating exactly as it was designed to operate. So I think we should start from that premise that when we see uh, this systemic racism going on and the issue of trying to dis, uh, disenfranchise black people from the right to vote. When we see mass incarceration, when we see that when even people get caught on film, like Ahmed Arbery being shot for, while jogging, and then the prosecutors refuse to prosecute, um, this is by design. It, it, it is, so it's not a broken system. And, and I want that to be very clear that America was established upon um, a racial hierarchy overtly and it's been de facto since uh, we've had 19, I mean, even uh, as Dr. Sara mentioned, we're around the same age. Um, the, uh, it just became legal for a person of color to marry a white person in America with uh, Loving versus the Virginia case in, in, in 1970. I was born in 1971, right? Um, so it was interracial marriage just got legalized not that long ago in America. I mean, this isn't something that is just like way, way, way back in the days of black and white TVs. And uh, yeah. it's something very American. So I just had to say that. So thank you very much, Dr. Sauter, for what you presented. I just want to put a little. Uh, exclamation point on what you what you were saying. Absolutely, absolutely. Sarah, would you like to add on to that? You know, I, I would. I absolutely echo what what Sheikh Daoud just said. It is. It was by design. Um, and let me just show you the difference, right? Everybody read. Everybody learns when we were a kid. We learned the story of Hazrat Bilal alayhi salam, right? Of uh, the beloved story of his beautiful voice and his adhan, and you know, he was a slave. And, but what, and most people identify him as a slave and they stop. And they say he converted to Islam and Islam freed him. That is true. Let me tell you what else is true. And this has never, ever, ever been documented that I know of. Find something and tell me and correct me. I'll, I'll accept it. In any society, in any part of the world, in the history of the world, I have not known of a man who goes from being a slave 
in one lifetime to being minister of treasury of the city of Medina, right? So what that sort of social advancement, right, that you get, that economic advancement um, that one person in his lifetime granted by our Prophet Sallallahu in within the framework of Islam, I have never seen that. There is, I have never known a, from a, a, for one human being to go from being a slave to a minister. So if we can harness that energy of Islam, harness that, that, that the, the heart and the spirituality of the, the belief behind what the prophet did, right? That wasn't, that wasn't an accident, right? The prophet Sallallahu knew, he saw what kind of human Hazrat Bilal alayhi salam was and, and elevated him to that position of power, of treasury. This doesn't even happen in America in 2020. I think I saw a question. So we have a comment from Lena. And Lena is saying, so what makes us think that the evil architects of the system are just going to turn the power over to the people? If they are the architects, might it be the case that this chaos is part of their plan? So I think she's referring to what Sheikh Imam Daoud just said, that it is by design, basically. So um, the comment is, if they are the art architects, might it be the case that chaos is part of their plan? Sheikh Bell, do you want to start? Um, power never relinquishes its power willingly, right? People who are oppressors and... Uh, they never give up power willingly and they seek to cause confusion. And they even have collaborators within the oppressed group that aid them in the oppression of, 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 of those people. So the most mentioned prophet in the Quran is Musa alayhi salam. And Fir'aun is, is shown in the Quran as an archetype for tyranny. And we, we tend not, when we read the Quran, I want you to try to like reframe some of our reciting of the Quran or reading of the Quran, our, our tafsir, that the story of Musa and the Bani Israel and Fir'aun is a mirror somewhat of what African Americans have gone through in America for about 400 years. Because the Bani Israel were enslaved for 400 years in Egypt. And Fir'aun slayed the children of Israel that weren't from his people. So there's an element of racism that was involved in that enslavement of the children of Israel who weren't Kipti or who were not Egyptian people, right? And when Musa and Harun, peace be upon both of those prophets, came to uh, Fir'aun and said, um, you know, um, let my people go. Uh, the, what, what did Fir'aun say? He said, no, I'm the most high Lord. I'm the one that's running things. This is my system, right? And, and then Fir'aun uh, even used some collaborators within the Bani Israel to try to bring doubts amongst the people, right? So uh, are there people, do, do we expect uh, people who are in control to willingly see their power they're benefiting from? Of course not. Of course not. Um, and do I think that um, there are people involved in some of these protests that uh, have bad intentions? Yes, I do. I think the masses of the people involved in the protests are sincere. But do I think that there are some uh, provocateurs in there that are trying to uh, that are trying to um, sow seeds of division and try to divert the message, of course. And um, this is part of history. We've seen this in uh, history of Muslims and we see it in the history of the civil rights movement. When Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did his first protest for sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee in 1968, and there was some uh, breaking of windows and some sort of so-called looting took place. If you look at the declassified counterintelligence uh, program papers, COINTELPRO, J. Edgar Hoover, the government actually had informants that infiltrated the march that broke windows to try to cause chaos, which then justified further 
militarized types of actions upon black people and the protesters, right? So um, I, you know, one thing is for sure is that the people who do these things, their sunnah doesn't change. The sunnah of Fir'aun, there's many different Fir'auns. Fir'aun is not just one person that lived 5,000 years ago. The, 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 the Fir'aunic system and people who have the arrogant Fir'auni mentality, this is, this, this is in effect right now. So uh, um, I know that might sound a little harsh to some of you, but it's, it's, it, it, it's a haqiqah. It's, it's, it's real. Mm -hmm. And I will remind everybody, it's also, Lena, don't give up hope. Don't feel like this is part of some grand plan of creating chaos. And so that therefore we're going to just be pawns again. Don't think that way. You realize that as Sheikh Bob said, throughout history, before there is huge, significant, systematic institutional changes, there is often entropy. There's often this energy, this chaos, this, this frustration where the country unites, right? And let's have an honest conversation. I have never seen so many white people talk about Black Lives Matter in my adult life, right? Black Lives Matter up until two months ago was anathema. It was like, oh my God, we can't say that. You guys know in, in Little Rock, to, as of two months ago, those t-shirts that were, were Black Lives Matter were sold and then they were taken off the market because our legislature had a concern that it was too inflammatory. And now look at that change. So we have the, a lot of the people who are traditionally seen as people in higher power positions, white people, coming forth and saying, we're not, we can't, we saw a man, his life was taken from him in front of the entire world's eyes. And I think we are seeing a slight frame shift. And we like to believe that frame shifts occur like this. They don't, they occur a couple of angles at a time, but it will happen. Also remember that Martin Luther King was once identified as a terrorist in this country. Now he is seen by our presidents and, and is revered and they talk, talk, talk about peace and he was always peaceful, but they created a narrative of that he was a terrorist. So these narratives are created by people who are in power and it's up to us to acknowledge and equip ourselves with the knowledge of history so that we know that that is exactly not true. We have to not believe in these things. That's true. And also uh, Nelson Mandela was prosecuted mm -hmm. under anti-terrorism laws. Mm -hmm. Right, so Nelson Mandela was called a terrorist. So um, it's also the smear campaigns when people are trying to stand up for their dignity against systemic oppression, against racism. Then normally, uh, it, the um, the propaganda campaigns come out where the victims end up being labeled as as the as the wrongdoers and as the and as the uh, the people who are the real threat. That's right. Uh, Iman Dao, when you were talking about um, Jahal and especially um, when you're talking about um, uh, before you talked about Kibber, you talked about meritocracy for um, briefly. Uh, you said that racism stems from pride and you talked about two kinds of pride. One was pride in something external like appearance versus internal, which is character. And you also talked about taking pride in something that you have no merit for, that you can, that you're not responsible for, and that's what leads to racism. So, would you just briefly comment on what does Islam say about merit, especially relating to non-Muslims? What is the concept of merit progress in Islam? Merit okay, well, color and creed both. Okay, so uh, number one, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam made this very clear at his farewell. Uh, sermon at the pilgrimage on the, on Mount Arafat. He said, the Arab has no virtue over the non-Arab, nor does the non-Arab have a virtue over the Arab. And the black does not have virtue over the Ahmar, literally means red. And I'll explain what he means by this. Uh, he meant by this. And the red has no merit over the black except in taqwa, illa bit taqwa is what the hadith says, right? So uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam articulated very clearly that just because of what one's family you were born into doesn't make you better, 
or what land you were born into makes you better. Because the word uh, ajami, meaning non-Arab, um, also means foreigner. It means foreigner, right? Someone who's foreign outside from the land of the Arabs, right? Then he says, and the black is not better than the red. And how Arabs understood this word Ahmar 1400 years ago. Ahmar meant the Persians and the Byzantines. It meant the Persians and the Byzantines or Qamurum as it's mentioned in the Quran. This is what it means, right? So um, the Arabs actually at that time, uh, the original Arabs were actually uh, quite dark in color and had predominantly had darker hair. So the the, the Arabs of old, before they began to uh, intermarry or have children by uh, Persians and Turks and Armenians, they actually look closer to like how I look, right? Like how most Sudanese look. That's how Arabs of old predominantly looked. But anyway, that gives no merit over these this lineage or this physical uh, uh, appearances uh, according to the time of the... Um, according to the teachings of Islam and the Prophet Now, one point that you brought up in actual, uh, Dr. Sarah mentioned this, that as um, ignorance uh, is also tied into racism, and we have the term jahil. And there's basically two types, right? And one can play into what is labeled implicit bias, and another is related to a form of when people through their ignorance, uh, try to impose their will upon other people and harm other people intentionally. So one is, is without malice and the other one has malice intention. So the first is called Jahl Basit. And this is like an innocent type of ignorance because one simply doesn't know better or one doesn't have malicious intention but has been conditioned to view something a certain way though they don't have a malicious intention. So Ali ibn Abi Talib said, majahilu, that people are adversaries to what they're ignorant of. So this is the first type, right? Man, where most of us, we incline to be scared of the unknown. And then we tend to push away or be antagonistic to what we don't know, right? So this is, but this is uh, less malicious. It still can have consequences, right? Like, um, Harming people is not simply uh, about intentions, also about impact. So uh, one of my teachers told me once, you know, you can be sincere and be sincerely wrong. You can be sincere and be, sincerity is not enough, right? We can be sincere and be sincerely wrong. But God judges us based upon, you know, our, our sincerity. We can still harm people. The other is called jahul morakab. This is really what's called compounded, in, uh, compounded ignorance, like Abu Jahl. He had this, or like Umayyah bin Khalif, like the people who tortured Bilal and took him out on the, um, the hot sands. And I want to paint a picture for you too. When they used to drag Bilal out into the desert and crush him with rocks, that's not really any different from what this officer did to George Floyd. Allah Azawajal just spared Bilal because, uh, you know, and, and rose up Bilal to station of Wilaya, to sainthood, right? But Bilal got crushed just like how George Floyd got crushed, right? We, we need to make these comparisons in our, in our religious tradition because this stuff isn't new. That's the point I'm trying to make, right? So this compounded um, hard-hearted ignorance when someone is presented with the truth consistently over and over and over again and they deny the truth and double down and then they they further their actions in the society why because they don't want to give up their positional power right because abu jahl he was like that guy you know in 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 uh in mecca him and uh umayyah bin khalif they were the ruling class in mecca right and they didn't want their their status uh they didn't want uh things to be equal, right? And, and that's, a, that's a, a higher form of, of ignorance according to the, um, what we have in our Islamic text, those two words. Jazakumullah uh, khairan, Imam Dawood. As you all know, those who know me, I really like to stick to time and we have a couple of minutes before we need to close. 
So a few reminders. One thing which both of our speakers highlighted and which stuck with me is that um, in different ways, they highlighted that one of our, the biggest enemy, I think what, what we face right now immediately is ignorance. Jahal, how can we fix a problem unless we are aware of that problem? We need to acknowledge the disease and be aware of it to fix it first. Or in prophetic words, we can say, man arafa nafsuhu faqad arafa rabbuhu, to know yourself is to know God. So we need to be really educating ourselves and being aware of the problems that maybe lie within. And that's where it all starts. With that said, I want to thank you both of our guests for your generosity in time and offering your wisdom. Uh, it's very, very clear to all of us that from the very beginning, Islam was conceived on the great notions of equality. And also what I realize is that how much disconnected we are from prophetic traditions within our own homes and communities and sometimes in our masajid too. And this idea might be novel that the Islamic ideology can positively impact American race relations. But even listening to these wonderful speakers and a cursory glance at Islamic teachings reveal that a deep commitment to Islamic principles can directly challenge American racism. Assalamu alaikum. Take care, everyone. Assalamu alaikum.